You should have the remains of the third descender on your person, yes? I believe it may be called a gnosis. The gnosis is the remains of the what? Version 4.2 had a lot of little lore bombs that really shook the foundations of everything we know, and for a lot of people, it probably wasn't in a good way. I don't think anyone expected the Gnosis to be the remains of the Third Descender, of all things, for example. I mean, it certainly took me by surprise. I mean, I was pretty confused for a while about how and why the Gnosis were the remains of the Third Descender and what it might mean for the game as a whole, and... Then I had an unexpected epiphany, and it just changed the way I saw everything. Because, see, there are no retcons, there are no inconsistencies, and there are no misdirections, like I was really afraid there was going to be. There are only stars. And if we follow this trail of stars like a trail of thought, we can begin to see exactly what Hoyo has been trying to hide, especially when it comes to the mysteries behind the powers of the Gnosis, the true nature of visions, and the perplexing existence of the Dragon Sovereign's throne. So alrighty guys, you know the drill, timestamps, spoiler warnings, links to other videos, and resources for further reading are down in the description box, while post video corrections and notes will be in a pinned comment if you need them. So without further ado, let's get this celestial theory started. Get it? Started? Because the, the theory is about stars. I'll just start the video. The twins are stars. Full stop, there is no way to contest this. It is stated a bunch of times in game, even by the Traveler themselves. The Traveler is also the fourth descender, and since descending is basically just fancy falling, that kind of makes the Traveler a falling or shooting star, doesn't it? Kind of like a meteor? And logic would then dictate that if the Traveler is a fallen star and a descender, then other descenders could be stars as well, right? And this alone may explain why the Gnosis, which are the remains of the third Descender, have properties in common with the Traveler who is the fourth Descender. Now let's see if we can flesh out this connection by looking at the four things every Gnosis has been confirmed to be able to do, and then compare that to the Traveler's abilities. In doing so, we should be able to confirm whether or not the third Descender could be a star just like the Traveler. As of patch 4.2, the Gnosis are confirmed to be able to do the following. 1. They can resonate with Celestia directly. 2. They can summon massive amounts of energy. 3. They can grant Archon's divine ability to protect their nation. And 4. They can house the obsessions of their wielder. Okay, so let's start with ability 1, resonating with Celestia directly. At the end of the prologue, when Venti is explaining what a Gnosis is, he presents them as symbols of Archonhood that can resonate with Celestia directly. Then he immediately compares them to visions, calling the latter primitive tools compared to the Gnosis, and that they allow people to ascend to godhood. So stick with me while I connect the dots on this one, because to understand why this matters, we need to revisit some really old lore. Way back during 1.1's Unreconciled Stars event, we learned that the sky of Tibet is fake and that the stars are merely rocks, condensed crystals full of memories of the person whose constellation that they belonged to. This false sky is also known as a firmament, and it's also a type of barrier that surrounds Tivat. Now more recently, during the final installment of the Narts and Croitz questline, you can find notes left behind by Rene, which say, To receive a vision is to sell oneself to the fate of this world. Now this is critical information because Nouvellet's character stories explain in explicit detail that this system of fate is one that was created by Celestia to control the living beings of Tevat. If you haven't guessed yet, this system is also the stars and constellations hanging in the firmament. That's why you can use these stars as a method of fortune telling, as illustrated by Mona. So basically, the firmament and the stars within it are actually a fate-controlling system used by Celestia, and both visions and gnosis are tools to bind life forms to this system in a unique way. Remember this because we're going to be diving into this in more detail in another section. For now, I would like to point out that it is heavily suggested that the branches of Erminsul are what make up this fake sky, and these crystal stars are just Erminsul's fruits hanging from those branches. This makes sense because Erminsul is a tree that holds the memory of the world, and we know from unreconciled stars that the stars are directly tied to one's memories. I made a whole video on this topic that I will link in the description box if you're interested in the details, because we're not going to have time to go into all of them right now. 
But this idea is also supported in a bit of an unorthodox and new way. See, these little nodes within Erminsel are eerily similar to teleport waypoints, which are connected to Erminsel's root system, and during the Parade of Providence event, Layla says the following about them. Do you ever get the feeling that the Lee lines have a regular flow? Similar to the way that celestial bodies follow fixed orbits. If we were looking down from on high, I wonder whether we'd find that the Ley Lines are just the reflections of the stars upon the Earth. Now you might be wondering why I'm making all these roundabout connections. The thing is, visions grant elemental powers, but the Traveler doesn't get their powers from a vision, they get them when they touch a Statue of Seven, which, in theory, draws its power from the Ley Lines, which are getting powered from Erminsel, which I think is actually the same thing as resonating with Celestia. Because prior to touching the Statue of the Seven, the Traveler did not possess a constellation or elemental powers. Touching the statue is what granted them both the constellation and elemental powers. So if getting a vision binds one to the fate written within the sky's constellation and gives elemental powers, then touching the Statue of Seven gives the Traveler the same properties as a vision. So what does this have to do with the Gnosis? Because that's what we're trying to compare, remember, the Traveler and the Gnosis. Well, remember that visions are primitive versions of the Gnosis, meaning a Gnosis must do something similar. If visions allow one to become a god and gods can possess a Gnosis, and we know a Gnosis can amplify one's abilities to manipulate elemental energy just like visions, then it is logical to assume that a Gnosis can also bind a god to a particular fate. This may be why gods and the Traveler have unique constellations that reflect their own image. They are special constellations, unique fates. Now remember this for later, it's going to be very important. For now, let's talk about the Gnosis' second ability. The ability to summon massive amounts of energy. This is best illustrated by Nahida and Fosilors. Nahida needed a massive amount of power to delete Ruka Devada, power that could only be summoned via the Gnosis, while Fosilors needed the Gnosis to amass power over the course of 500 years in order to destroy her divinity. We've seen the Traveler summon massive amounts of energy, but whenever they do this, it's always with the help of nearby people. So it would be easy to assume that the Traveler is just borrowing the power of others instead of summoning raw power like a Gnosis is. But this is where things get kind of interesting. If you watch these scenes where the Traveler does their golden power up closely, you'll notice that the Traveler starts the encounter by having a power level akin to an average vision user. But as the hopes and wishes of the people around them begin to increase, the Traveler's power level increases as well, even from the people without visions. Now let me remind you that the Traveler is a star, and people have a long history of wishing on stars. So if the Traveler is a star, then doesn't it make a lot of sense that the collective wishes and hopes and dreams of the people around them would grant them the power to grant those wishes, regardless of whether or not those people have any elemental power at all? We'll hold this thought as we look into the third ability of the Gnosis, to grant Archons the divine right to protect their nation. Archons are not descenders, as far as we know anyway, so let's assume that they are also not stars. But if descenders are stars and the Gnosis are made of the remains of the third descenders, then the Gnosis must contain the fragment of a star. I will take this opportunity to remind you that the Archons derive their power from people's faith. But what is faith towards a god if not the power of prayer? And what is prayer if not a wish? So what if Gnosis are given to Archons out of necessity because the Gnosis respond to the wishes of the people within an Archon's nation and can, in times of crisis, grant an Archon enough strength to grant their people's wishes by using the power of the star fragment within it? Is that not exactly what the Traveler is doing? And that brings me to the final ability of the Gnosis, their propensity to house the obsessions of the wielder. Something that also makes the Gnosis more like visions, since visions are the manifestations of one's ambition, which is an obsession-adjacent thing, in my opinion, anyway. 
Now, this little tidbit about the Gnosis containing obsessions comes from the confrontation with Scaramouche, who wanted the Gnosis to replace his heart. It stands to reason that the Gnosis will reflect the intent of the person who holds it, no matter how pure or corrupt they are, because it's, you know, a, a star that people can wish on. How can it discriminate between a good wish or a bad wish? And this could be why Dottore and Skirk call masterless Gnosis these harbingers of disaster that you kind of need to get rid of. Because without someone to control what sort of wishes reach the star inside of the Gnosis, a masterless Gnosis will likely respond to any and all wishes indiscriminately. Therefore, the Archon's role must be to be the host of the Gnosis. They are the will that keeps a Gnosis in check because the Gnosis has no sentience, and without sentience, how could it distinguish between a wish that would accomplish good things and a wish that would accomplish terrible things? Think of it a bit like an uncontrollable force of nature. And this would kind of explain why all of the winners of the Archon War were never the ones who were the strongest, but were instead the ones who loved humanity the most. They had to love humanity the most in order to ensure that they could use that wish-powered Gnosis for their benefit. Power was never a factor because the Gnosis just straight up grants raw power at will. Now you're probably wondering if Gnosis are star fragments granted to those who achieved Archonhood in order to grant wishes of their people, then how can Visions be their primitive versions? It's not like Visions are fragments of another Descender, right? Well, that's true. However, I do think Visions are also stars, but lesser stars. I've already made an entire theory video about how I think Visions come from dragons, so it might seem weird that I'm now saying Visions are stars. Unless, of course, a dragon's power source is a star. Now, we in the biz call that foreshadowing. In Nouvellet's character stories, we learned that when a person's wish reaches the heavens, the Archons must grant them a gift, a piece of their mastery over the elements. This gift takes the form of a vision. It's pretty straightforward, right? Well, this lines up with what we already knew about visions being the manifestations of someone's ambition, because having an ambition implies having a goal that needs to be achieved, and what is an ultimate goal but a wish that you plan to grant for yourself, right? In this way, visions still maintain their status as external organs, because your wish is also a part of you. If you perish before your wish is actually fulfilled, then you might leave behind something called a masterless vision. This masterless vision would be an unfulfilled wish, which can only be reignited by someone who possesses the same level of ambition that would have fulfilled that wish. And that's why this vision here lit up when Kazuha blocked the Muso no Hitotachi. He fulfilled his friend's wish that was contained within the vision. And this is kind of why I call visions stars, not because they're fragments of a descender, but because they're accomplishing the same thing as a gnosis on a much smaller scale. It's all wish fulfillment. Gnosis can respond to the wishes of many people all at once, while visions only seem to respond to the wish of a single person. Now, this wish connection might also be why, in the Genshin manga, you'll often see visions ditching their element symbol in favor of something a bit more... celestial. This star shape is the same as the one used for basically any star that is not the four-pointed Primo star. You can see it in Yoimiya's second story quest, Mona's Golden Apple Archipelago domain, and it's even the same shape as the intertwined and acquaint fates that we wish with. Now, obviously, visions are not fragments of the third descender, but they are manifestations of wishes, and since wishes are star-powered, only makes sense that the so-called mastery that grants them also comes from a star. Now, Chapter 4's Archon Quest taught us that an Archon's power does not just come from their Gnosis, but also from their throne, which is a new concept. And this throne appears to contain the authorities that Celestia stole from the Dragon Sovereigns. Now, it doesn't make much sense for two different powers to be attributed to one object, so it's very likely that an Archon's so-called mastery and the stolen Dragon Authorities are actually the same thing. This idea is further supported by the fact that Dragon Sovereigns can also grant visions. Now, how do I know a dragon can grant a vision? Well, it's directly stated in Nouvellet's character story. 
This character story says that by destroying herself, Fosilors also destroyed her heavenly throne, and that was what allowed Nouvellet to regain his authority, which he used to, quote, reforge his throne. And the very first vision that was given out under his rule was to Farina, and that vision is very unique. Not only does it grant her control over both Numa and Usia, but it has very tiny claws on it, which are not present on any other Fontanian vision. It almost looks like a dragon claw clutching a pearl. Which is an amazing detail considering how Nouvellet's setting aside parts of himself is likened to a dragon treasure hoard in his character stories, and how he claims at the end of the Archon quest to have complete control over Numosia. The only conclusion here is that Nouvellet gave Farina a piece of his authority. Visions are actually dragon pearls, that's a real thing. And did you know that in Chinese folklore, dragon pearls are actually called wish-granting pearls? All of this makes me wonder if those who receive visions are destined to become dragons that ascend beyond the heavens and become a real star. After all, it's a common theme in Chinese folklore that anyone who possesses the pearl of a dragon can become a dragon and ascend to heaven. Which is funny because Nouvellet refers to the dragon king Nibelung as the heavenly father in Chinese, and this exact phrase is used to describe God itself like a Yahweh-type god, the creator of all things. So the name Nibelung might have been a pun because the root word in it, Nibel, can also mean cloud, like clouds in the heavens. And the ties between heaven and dragons doesn't stop there. Now, the fact that Nouvellet is the heart of the Primordial Sea, which is basically a sea of stardust, and the fact that he equates Nibelung with heaven itself, suggests to me that the dragons in Genshin were originally of celestial origin. Now, I'm talking space celestial, not celestia celestial, okay? Just to be clear. In fact, this is a repeating theme in Hoyo's other games, too. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to waste any time trying to directly connect these games together, but it is undeniable that Hoyo is trying to create a sort of multiverse within which its games are set, and throughout that Hoyoverse, a lot of the themes seem to repeat themselves. For example, in Honkai Star Rail, the ancient Leviathans appear to have been these godlike draconic beings that were birthed from stars. And then in Honkai Impact, there's this very interesting story about a star descending to a planet and terraforming it, and the tale is eerily similar to the one told in Before Sun and Moon. And it also kind of parallels a scientific theory that a meteor seeded all life on Earth. A meteor being a shooting star, in this case. And the star in this story uses the character for gem, bead, or pearl, which is the same term as the one used for visions. And like I mentioned earlier, visions are akin to dragon pearls. You starting to see the pattern here? So if stars and dragons are intrinsically linked and descenders are also stars, then descenders might be also a bit draconic in nature, which may explain why the Traveler's Combat Kit resembles that of the dragons more than that of the Archons, and why the Traveler seems to be compatible with all of these systems within Tevat. It's not so much that the Traveler is from Tevat originally, but that they belong to the same type of being that this planet's original life forms are based on the Dragon Sovereigns. Now, all this talk about pearls and dead stars reminded me of the Buddhist Sariras. These are essentially gems or pearls that form within the cremated remains of a spiritual master and, much like dragon pearls, contain that person's spiritual essence and knowledge. These Sarira are often kept in vessels known as reliquaries, many of which strongly resemble the Gnosis. These Sarira are said to contain the knowledge and spiritual essence of the person whose remains they were formed in, which reminds me a heck of a lot of delusions, since delusions were made from the crystallized power found on Orobashi's remains. This means that anyone with a delusion was simply borrowing Orobashi's power without permission, and that power was pretty toxic if the effects of the Tataragami were anything to go by. So it's no wonder that the uh, power kind of backfired on the wielders. And speaking of taking things without permission, Celestia sure has a history of stealing star power, don't they? I mean, they stole the star power of both twins at the beginning of the game, then they stole a whole planet from these star dragons, then they proceeded to steal those star dragons' powers, and, you know, based on this flavor text from the star lamp, 
it's actually possible that the four shades of the primordial one weren't actually part of the primordial one, but were instead stars whose powers were stolen. Cause it says here that imprisoned starlight leaves behind shade or shadows, which is a weirdly specific thing to say. Like, why not just say it leaves behind darkness? Why be so specific on the shade part, unless that has some sort of deeper meaning? And if there is a deeper meaning, then it makes all these references to black stars throughout the game a bit more suspicious. Like, I'm wondering if these blackened stars are stars that were imprisoned and then had their light stolen, like how the Traveler's lights were blacked out at the beginning of the game. It makes me wonder if Deshret was originally a golden star, and the reason he took the form of a blackened star was because he had been imprisoned. In other words, his light was stolen or sealed. After all, I mean, his demon name was Amun, which is the same name as the Egyptian creator deity who later merged with the sun god Ra, and suns are obviously stars. This description also suits Paimon with her black hair accessory and little constellation particle effects, as well as all of the Conrians who wanted to challenge heaven and carried the banner of a black star with them. And it might even apply at least in part to the sustainer of heavenly principles since her stars are a mix of black and gold. Perhaps her light wasn't completely stolen. And since the stars in Tavat's false sky are actually part of Celestia's system of fate, which it uses to control all life on the surface, I wonder if that's where all of the stolen star-based powers are actually kept. Perhaps these lights are tied to false stars so that they can't escape. But weren't the dragon authorities kept inside the Archon's thrones instead, not a star? Like, surely a throne and Celestia's fake stars can't be related too, right? Right? Up until the end of Chapter 4's Archon Quest, I actually thought those references that we had to Heavenly Thrones was kind of more of a metaphorical thing. I mean, I figured there might be a literal throne in Celestia somewhere, but I thought of them as more like symbolic instead of serving a real practical function. And then Fossilors destroyed one and a dragon got their authority back, so clearly these Heavenly Thrones are critical infrastructure but we've never actually seen one, not even in the scene where one was destroyed, and I found that kind of confusing. I was this close to writing off Fossilor's talk of thrones as being metaphorical again, and then I remembered the words of the Abyss Twin during the We Will Be Reunited quest. Until the Abyss has engulfed the thrones, my war with destiny will see no end. Given that a dragon's authority appears to be locked within a throne, the thrones must be real and powerful things that exist somewhere in order for the Abyss Twin to want to destroy them. So then, what is it? And where is it? Now, canonically, we know next to nothing about these thrones, but I have a hypothesis that the word throne might refer to a part of a constellation. Here's my rationale. In Chinese mythology, the gods of heaven are structured like an ancient Chinese government. You've got the Jade Emperor, his advisors, administrators, magistrates, and all kinds of governmental positions and stuff. And this whole system of governance is literally reflected in the patterns of stars. The Emperor is the polar star, and the stars around him make up his palace and other physical structures within heaven itself, while some other stars and constellations belong to real deities. This is why the Chinese word for constellation is literally destiny seat, because it's like a seat in parliament. Now I'm thinking that within Celestia's system of fate, there are reserved spaces or seats for every person. Those with greater importance get greater seats, so a dragon king must be given the greatest seat because they are greatly important. Something like a, I don't know, king's seat or a throne. And the same should be true for an Archon since, you know, they're gods. Now I think that the throne Fossilors destroyed in Chapter 4 was part of a special constellation where Celestia was keeping Nouvellet's authority. Namely, her constellation. And that's why it was so crucial that she deceive Celestia and defy her own fate in order to return his authority to him. Deceiving fate and destroying fate are almost synonymous. And in this case, it destroyed a physical object, part of her constellation. And I think this was her plan from the very, very start. 
Now, if you read through Nouvellet's character stories, you might remember that 500 years ago, he received a letter from Foslors, and it was an invitation. She said, I shall leave you a seat with the best view in the greatest theater. Now, throughout his character stories, the term seat is mostly used as foreshadowing for her intent to pass the throne over to him. This is most obvious in Chinese because of the specific character used for seat. It's the same as the one used for Destiny's seat, a constellation. This same character is later used in combination with the one for the king, making it a king's seat, or a throne. So after Fosolores destroyed her own throne, Nouvellet was able to reclaim his authority and was able to then reconstruct his throne. And this one is not under the control of Celestia. Now I've read that in Chinese astrology, the brightest star in a constellation is often called a king, while the rest of the stars are called princes. Now I think, and this is wild speculation here, that dragons are actually their own constellations. Like, Physically, they are the manifestation of their constellation. And I think that their king star, or their brightest star, is the equivalent of their throne. This makes it their dragon pearl, the thing that contains all of their power and wisdom and knowledge and stuff. So maybe their body is made up of all of the prince stars, but their power and knowledge and such is contained in their king star. So without their king star, they are considered an incomplete dragon. Now, I think a similar logic applies to Archons, whereby they are not actually their constellations, but that their constellation dictates their fate, and their king star is a re-gifted dragon authority which grants Archons their divinity. Now, since Fosalors was the isolated divinity of Farina, Fosalors was permanently bound to her king star. So if she destroyed herself, the king star would also be destroyed, and only the prince stars would remain, and that's basically Farina. Now I think this is why Nouvellet says his constellation is his own reflection in his character stories, and that's why he's also free of Celestia's fate system. He's literally his own constellation. Now if you're wondering about this Leviathan constellation that he has, apparently it's a completely separate secondary constellation that he selected for himself so Melazines could have fun reading his astrological charts in the Steambird because they couldn't do this if they were to use his real one. It's suggested that only those who possess the power to change the world can have a constellation that is an image of themselves. For example, Mona does not appear to be able to read the fate of people who possess constellations that are their owner's reflections like Venti or the Traveler, so it stands to reason that the same would be true for Nouvellet and Farina. Now, Farina's fate is basically the prophecy that Mona says is the fate of the world, something that can only be read by a visionary. Which is probably why, despite not being a god anymore, Farina still has a constellation that is in her image. She already changed the fate of the world. And, uh, speaking of... Within Tevat, the role of the Traveler appears to be that of the Wish Granter. By traveling through Tevat, they learn about the people and act as a catalyst in making their wishes come true. But it seems like the ultimate goal is for them to replace the head honcho in Celestia. But for that to happen, we're probably gonna need to get everyone on board, and I think the Saritza might pose a bit of an obstacle to that. If you've ever wondered why the Saritza is collecting the seven Gnosis, it's probably because she intends to use all seven fragments of the Third Descender's star in order to make her own wish come true. To add to this, the Abyss Twin should also naturally possess the ability to grant wishes, but they're aligned with the Abyss, so they're probably intent on granting the wish of the Abyss instead. But you know, the Abyss Twin might actually be less of an issue than the Saritza. The Saritza will have all seven pieces of a complete Descender, which should put her on par with the Traveler who is also a Descender. But the Abyss Twin is not a Descender. And this is kind of a big deal because as of 4.2, we know what it means to be a Descender. See, in the Tower of Gestalt, you'll find a note from Renee which says the following. For not all that comes from beyond may be as one that descends. That title belongs only to wills that can rival an entire world. In other words, not every star is a descender. There could be dozens or hundreds of fallen stars in Tevat, and there's only four of them who can be considered descenders. Because only those four have the wills to rival an entire world. 
which means that if the Abyss Twin is not considered a descender, then their will is not strong enough to rival the world. That said, you know how I said the Abyss Twin might be trying to grant the wish of the Abyss? Well, in another set of Renee's notes, he mentions that the Abyss contains a will of its own. So it's very possible that the Abyss Twin is trying to compensate for their lack of descender status by replacing their own will with the will of the Abyss. And that might put them on the same level as the Saritza in terms of uh, posing an obstacle to the Traveler's goals. But regardless of which is which, one thing is pretty clear to me. Conria's original plan to overthrow Heaven involved that power from beyond that Dainsliff mentions in the Travail trailer, the power of a Descender. And it seems like everyone wants this incredible wish-granting power for their own reasons, but no one has been able to completely replicate it. The Saritza can only gather the dead fragments of a Descender, but may or may not possess the will to utilize them the way they need to be. Now, the Abyss Twin has the raw ability on their own, but they lack a will to rival the world, so they risk allowing the Abyssal will to override their own. And it's possible that Conria actually tried to summon a Descender from beyond the Firmament in order to achieve their own goals. I say this because Conria was tracking the twins long before they entered Tavat's orbit, and Wanderer then tells us that the twins only arrived because the heavens responded to the summoning, which means the twins were summoned. When this resulted in a failed descender, a la the Abyss Twin, Piero may have come up with a plan of collecting the Gnosis instead and joined forces with the Saritza. But don't you think it's odd that the Abyss has a will in the first place? A will that can potentially rival the world? I mean, it's almost like the Abyss itself is a uh, descender. Wait a second. If descenders are stars, then they might have a similar life cycle to stars from our own universe. Meaning they start as stellar nebula or stardust, then take one of two branching paths with three possible outcomes, a white dwarf, a neutron star, and a black hole. Isn't a black hole kind of like an endless abyss that engulfs everything? Well, now I'm wondering if the name of the game, Genshin, is a pun about the life cycle of stars. Like in Chinese, the game is called Wan Shen, but despite being pronounced a little differently and using different characters, if you read it backwards, it's Shen Wan, which means abyss. And I swear, if they based Conria on dwarves from dramatic folklore just so they could have the pun about the white dwarves, then I'm gonna, gonna, I, I, I don't know, actually, I'll probably just lay down on the floor and stare at the ceiling a little bit. I'm tired. You know, I'm weirdly excited about all the different lore implications if this theory turns out to be accurate. Like, the idea that we're all just wishing on stars, just, it completely changed my perspective on a lot of little lore bits. And on screen now are my lovely little channel members who help me make all my videos just by existing. Isn't that cool? And while they scroll on by, I kind of want to share a few last minute observations with you guys. The all-devouring narwhal is probably some kind of star beast. In fact, we know the narwhal is a star beast because of the lines, the star beasts will drink the amniotic fluid, and the amniotic fluid is the primordial sea, which is what the narwhal drank. And since visions are stars and this narwhal seems to be weirdly connected to Child's constellation, Child's vision may be subject to the narwhal's moods, which might be why it went all finicky at the beginning of chapter 4. Now also note that a few of the narwhal's attacks are tied to black holes, and black holes are the all-devourers of space, so uh, the name is probably pretty fitting. And one last thing. You know the whole thing about finding the Genesis Pearl in the Battle Pass? Well, I'm now like 85-ish percent sure that it's Nibelung's Dragon Pearl, since, you know, he's the Heavenly Father and thereby responsible for Genesis, supposedly. In fact, this may have been staring at us in the face for, like, ever since the very beginning of the game. Because, like, notice how the light sigils of Enkonomiya have the eight-pointed star with a circle in it. And now take a look at the icon for the Genesis Pearl in the Battle Pass. They're pretty similar, huh? So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure the Battle Pass story is about finding Nibelung's Pearl, which is probably somewhere lost in the Abyss, because where else would it be? 
But I think that's all for me for today, though. I just want to say thank you one more time to my channel members for all their wonderful support, and another special thanks to you, dear viewer, for watching and to for making it to the end of the video. Not many people do that. Well, take care of yourselves out there, guys, and I'll catch you all in the next video. Bye-bye!